This presentation is The Unification of Italy. It comes from one of our older regular world history books called The History of the Modern World. Um, and that's where we're taking most of it from. In the early part of the 19th century, uh, Italy was basically several small countries made up of pretty much one people, the Italians. Uh, that's also called consanguinous, which you, oh, we only unite people of the same blood. And that was one of the messages they tried to put forth in Italian unification. So if you look, you can see that Italy had several different smaller countries that made up what today is known as Italy. If you remember, we talked about Machiavelli a few weeks ago, actually a couple of months ago when he wrote The Prince, as most of you remember. But one of the things he was upset about Italy was the fact that it was so weak because it was not unified. It was made up of all of these uh, city-states, and it made it weak and easy prey for foreign influence. This slide didn't transfer very well, but this drive for unified, glorious Italy was called, or was called the Reorganizzamento, which means basically the resurgence. Some people have heard say it means the reorganization, but it basically means resurgence. You can probably see this map a lot better of the different parts of Italy before unification. You had uh, Piedmont, Sardinia, which was a kingdom. You had the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which was most of southern Italy. And all the states in between were either ruled by the Pope with French help or with the Austrians or with princes backed by the French, many of them actually Bourbon princes. As you know, the Roman Catholic Church was headquartered in Rome for most of its existence. It needed French troops to keep it independent, and it was against unification for most of the time. Napoleon III, who was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, supplied these troops, and they were in Rome for over 20 years. The area around Rome uh, was known as the Papal States because it was ruled by the Pope. And they wanted to main, remain independent, and the papacy wanted to maintain financial control. So he definitely was not for unification. Now there had been earlier uh, patriots, mainly led by Giuseppe Mazzini, who had organized a young Italy organization to build loyalty to the Italian nation basically saying that people who were Italian by blood should want to unify with other Italians. And this will also be, at the same time this is going on, the Germans are going through the same movement. All we needed now was for somebody to actually take the bull by the horns and bring all these countries together. And it was going to have to be done by force. And while you had guys like uh, Garibaldi and Mazzini, it would need a legitimate monarch, a legitimate country to do this, and that would be in the person of King Victor Emmanuel of Piedmont Sardinia, which was northern Italy, and he would help push to um, unify all of Italy. Here's here's another bad slide, uh, so I hope you can read it. But Piedmont Sardinia had a prime minister by the name of Camille Cavour, and he was very pro unification. Cavour knew that in order for Italy to be united, he would need France's help to prevent Austria from moving in and preventing unification. So he's going to try to get the French to basically switch sides or at least change the attitude that had in the past. And this would be a little bit easier because Napoleon III had a lot of pro-unification sympathies. France and Great Britain were in war with Russia in what is known as the Crimean War. So in order to get on the good side of the French, Cavour sent troops to support France and to help Britain in the Crimean War. That part they'll be able to help him when time comes. Now you're going to have a situation where Napoleon is going to agree to support Piedmont against Austria. Now again this is Piedmont Sardinia. But Napoleon's also going to tr show his true colors in this deal. Now again I want to remind you we're talking about Napoleon III not Napoleon Bonaparte. Now that Cavour knew that he had French help he started a war against Austria and France and Piedmont went to war against the Austrian Empire. Small revolutions broke out in the middle of Italy, in Parma, Modena, and Tuscany, and part of the Papal States, they had their governments collapse. 
Once these revolutions collapsed, they agreed to join uh, Piedmont Sardinia, and Garibaldi helped this a lot too as far as convincing them to do so. If you're wondering why some of the papal states deserted the Pope and joined the Piedmont, uh, let's talk about uh, something that happened with a young man named Edgar Mortera. He was a Jewish boy who was very sick, and his housekeeper slash nursemaid uh, thought that she could save him by baptizing him, giving him emergency baptism. Well, as a result of that, there was a law that said Jewish and non-Catholic people couldn't raise Catholic kids. Since he had been baptized, the Pope took him out of his home and um, basically raised him himself. And this caused many people to get angry with the papacy, and it also weakened its opposition to unification because of that. So by this time, now Italy's basically divided into three areas. Uh, a northern Italian kingdom made up of formerly Piedmont, Sardinia. In the south, you have the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And then you have right in the middle, the papal states. Napoleon III allowed this, but took Nice and Savoy, and they remain with France to this day. Though many people in these areas still speak Italian. This really upset Garibaldi, who was born in Nice. A Piedmont Republican by the name of Giuseppe Garibaldi organized a group of followers called Red Shirts. He landed in Sicily, then crossed to the mainland. The government of the two Sicilies collapsed, and very quickly they joined the Piedmont. A Piedmont Republican. So now let's look at Italian unification. You see Cavour and Garibaldi. They come together from the south and the north, and Garibaldi gives up his claims in favor of the monarch of Piedmont Sardinia, even though he did not like Cavour. Now when you look at this new map, you can see that Italy is almost completely united except for the area around Venetia in the north and around Rome, basically the papal states. Otto von Bismarck of Prussia convinced the Venetians to join with them to defeat, help defeat Austria in their brief war with Austria, and as a result, Venetia was given independence and joined the Italian Republic, or the, excuse me, the Kingdom of Italy. And Rome was finally made part of Italy after the French troops withdrew because of France's defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. As a result of this, the Pope basically became a prisoner within the Vatican. Now, when I mean prisoner, he was free to come and go, but he chose to stay in Vatican as protest against the seizure of the Papal States. And now, Italy's unification was complete. What started as a peninsula made up of several governments had become one, the, Repub the um, Kingdom of Italy. Without this unification, many Italian foods would not have been possible because the country would have been too poor to export them. Thought you guys would get a kick out of that. Now we're going to take some time and talk about some key players in the Italian Revolution or the unification of Italy. These are the key individuals. The first person we'll talk about is Giuseppe Mazzini. As you can see, he was a very serious looking individual who really wanted to um, turn Italy into a republic. He studied to be a lawyer, became a member of the Carbonari, which was a revolutionary movement. He led failed attempts at revolution during the 1830s, and he founded a group known as Young Italy. He was elected to the Triumvirate in 1849, and he criticized the new Italian state after 1870, mainly because it was a monarchy. What, was Mazzini, what were Mazzini's aims or goals? He encouraged people to see themselves as part of a nation. He wanted a democratic, independent Italian Republic, not a monarchy. Had the, he had the concept of a third Rome, which would be a civilizing influence on the world. What were, what were his methods? It's a little bit different. Education and revolution go hand in hand, according to Mazzini. 
sought support from the young, educated middle class, Italian people to drive the Austrians out, hoped that publicity and propaganda would create revolutionary classes, and he believed the constitutional monarchy should only be there temporarily. How big of an impact did Mazzini have on the unification of Italy? Well, he gave encouragement to Italian patriotism. He presented a new view of Italy. He inspired Garibaldi to join the movement, even though they didn't like each other that much. He helped to win international publicity for Italian freedom, and he single-handedly led the defense of Rome in 1849, even though it was a heroic failure and the French defeated them. But his actions, he put pressure on Cavour and others to act more positively, though. They were kind of shameful that this guy, who wasn't even a noble, was able to win this many people over. How successful was Mazzini? He had little practical experience. He overestimated his level of support. He ignored the problems of the peasants. Remember, he was mainly a middle class guy. His support was limited, and he used the carbonary methods, which are almost terroristic. All of his plots failed. Some middle class were actually alienated by his revolutionaryism, and he made no attempt to win support from peasants and town workers. But he was successful in though that he brought attention to the movement. Next, let's talk about what Mazzini said would happen with Italy. He believed Italian territory would be under foreign control. It needed to be changed. He believed that foreigners had played way too much an important role in the unification of Italy, mainly the French, and he was unhappy with the new constitution. But he took what he could get, I guess you could say. He had a very ambitious foreign policy. Aware of the shortcomings of the Italia Fara de Se, he aimed to move Austrians out of Lombardy and Venetia. As Prime Minister, he had considerable control over foreign policy. And when the Crimean War broke out between Britain and, Fr and when Britain and France took on Russia, he agreed to help the French and the British. He sent 15,000 15, troops. Excuse me. Come on, the Crimean War. There was a lot of doubt on his motivation, but mainly he just wanted to get support from Great Britain and France. His troops played only a minor role, but did win respect and gratitude from the Allies. And the Congress of Paris dealt with the peace negotiations, though Cavour was not directly involved in the talks. As a result of this, he gained foreign support through um, diplomacy and helping the, the British and the French in the Crimean War. And more people wanted to um, have an independent and unified Italy. He had an important link also with a society called the National Society. And many of them began to see Piedmont as the best chance for unification. Cavour now looked to France for help against Austria. Napoleon III was a supporter but sometimes a hindrance to Italian unity. He was the nephew of um, Napoleon Bonaparte. His real name was Louis Napoleon. He was a former member of the common era himself. His troops had crushed the Roman Republic in 1849, and he had his own reasons for aiding the Piedmont. He probably favored a federation headed by a pope instead of a kingdom. In January 1848, an Italian named Felice Orsini attempted to assassinate Napoleon III, and he had hoped that this would aid Italian unity. It actually um, spurred Napoleon into action. An agreement was made called the Compact of Flamberis. War with Austria. 1859, he started a war against Austria, and the French, with limited help from Piedmont, won two, two closely fought victories. Austria was on the brink of surrender, then all of a sudden, Napoleon pulled out of the war and signed the Truce of Villafranca. Cavour was furious and resigned as prime minister. 